Can you hear me? Oh, and you came back. Thank you. <laughs> I was worried, I have to say. So, my friends, wow. What a week we've had. What a week we've had. What a week we've had. What a week we have had. We have been on a journey. We've absolutely been on a journey, and I actually feel like, for myself, um, I'm just honored to have been invited to speak, but more than that, I feel honored to have been in this room to listen to the wisdom that's been dropped. There's been a lot of wisdom dropped here. I want to share with you tonight, I want to share with you a journey that I took recently. Um, in fact, Sammy Awad was there with me, um, and about 60 other faith leaders from around the world. It's a journey to South Africa. And in this journey, what I want us to do is I want you to imagine what you're seeing as I share with you what happened actually in this time in South Africa. But I also want you to imagine things that might sound a little familiar to you. The things that are here that you've seen here in Palestine, Israel, and the things that you have seen back home. Because we're going home tomorrow. And so the question that we have to answer tonight is the question of the extremism within us. Because quite honestly, one of the things that we know to be true is that the structures of injustice all around us have no power to stand if we say no. The only reason they are able to stand is because either we have said yes or we have remained silent. And so I want to share with you a journey. This journey begins on a road in South Africa. I arrived and some friends uh, on the second, the first day that I was there, first full day, they hopped me in a little car, it's like a little hatchback car, and they said, we want to show you Cape Town. It was Cape Town in particular. Now, Cape Town, you have to understand, is one of the most, if not the most, inequitable cities on the planet today. At least they tout that. A lot of other people tout that too. But actually, I really believe it after having seen what I saw. So they took me, and they decided to take me down by, uh, by the Cape first, by uh, the, the camp, Camps Bay. And Camps Bay, if you don't know, is an area that's plush. I mean, it's just green everywhere. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's fauna bursting from the soil. It's homes lining the mountainside, all looking over the bay and, and over the ocean on the other side. It is, it is where the white South Africans live. South Africaners, South Africans, it's where they live. And as we drove through Camps Bay and this area, we actually saw gilded garage doors. And we also saw razor wire that was strewn around the tops of all of the houses and the gates that lined the houses. These, I was not used to seeing that. In America, we see razor wire around prisons to keep prisoners in. But we didn't, we not, I don't, I've never seen razor wire around a rich person's home. Who is the prisoner in this situation? We went from Camps Bay, we went from Camps Bay and we actually started to go down by the airport. And the airport, um, it actually, there was a large separation like uh, basically a no man's land where you're driving and there's really nothing there. And then all of a sudden, they said, don't miss it. All of a sudden, there's a burst of color after the airport. And it is the colored township. Now, the colored township is where they took the people who used to live in District 6. District 6 was the place where the Khoi and the mixed race people did live up until about 1966-68 when they passed a law that said this District 6 area is going to be a whites-only area. So they went into the homes of those families, dragged out the families, and took them to this 
this township and other colored townships in the area. Now the thing that marked the colored township is that it's very full of color, but the color is actually painted onto the side of concrete homes, concrete apartment buildings. There is no grass. There are no trees. There was only apartments, 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 and they were right up on the road. And then we got back in the car and we drove a little longer through another no man's land, another separation. And then they said, don't miss it. And there was no way that I could because what happened was after about 10 minutes of driving uh, through nothingness, really just barren land, brown field on both sides, boom. We're in now in the black townships. And the black township, the homes were right up on the road. But there was something new that had just been strewn along the other side, actually, really, actually right up on the road, uh, on the other side were the, were the actual homes. But here you had a line of porta potties. And they were happy that they got the porta potties because they just got porta potties. After living in scrap metal homes for decades with no running water and no electricity because they had been taken there, put there, when the English and the Dutch and the Germans and whoever else came and conquered that land, removed them from their land and put them there. Now remember, before they were taken from that land, they were prosperous. They had businesses, they had families, they had family dwellings, they had multiple generations. They were well, but now they live in land that is, they have houses that are strewn together with tin and steel. And they rejoice over porta potties. And when we got out of the car, later I was able to get out of the car, you could literally smell the smell of feces rising from the ground. How do Christians live like this from day to day, live in this from day to day in South Africa? I wondered as we drove back home, how can you be a Christian in this place and live with yourself? And it hit me, there's two ways. Either you fight it, or you adopt a theology that has nothing to do with it. Isaiah 58 is my text, our text for tonight. Isaiah 58, the context of Isaiah 58 is actually it's before the Assyrian siege of the northern kingdom and the Babylonian siege of, the, of Jerusalem. And the state of the people is actually outlined for us in the text. The state of the people, you can see it in verse 2. In verse 2 where it says, they seek God. They delight to know my ways, God says, as if. And Mark Laberton kind of sat on this for a minute a couple of days ago. As if they practiced righteousness and didn't forsake the ordinances of God, as if. And we see in the text, they're living one way inside the church and another way inside daily life. Another way to put it is that they have separated out their relationship with God from their relationship to the least of these. You can see it. In the text, you see their relationship with God is that they're seeking God. They want to be close to God. They delight to know God's ways. They're even fasting. Fasting is a spiritual practice. There's an earnest appearance of desire for God. And yet, the relationship with the least of these at the exact same time is that they are serving their own interests. They are oppressing their workers. Can you imagine, just picture it, someone fasting here and then going back and withholding wages from their workers here while fasting. 
They're quarreling and fighting. They're allowing the hungry to stay hungry. They're allowing the homeless to stay homeless. They're allowing those who have been stripped to remain naked and vulnerable. And they're even allowing their kin, their own kin in distress, to remain in distress. And here's my favorite. They're pointing the finger. They're pointing the finger. Now, what is that about? It's about avoiding responsibility. He did it. She did it. It's their responsibility. And then my, my penultimate favorite, they're speaking of evil. Now, I don't know why, but I get curious about the, about the actual words sometimes, so I look it up, and the word speaking of evil, the word speaking there is the word aven, um, or evil, rather, is aven, uh, speaking of evil. To exert oneself in vain is actually what it means. To exert oneself in vain. To talk about justice, but not do justice. They're talking, 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 but not ever doing. And really have no intent to do. Now flash forward one day. I'm on a pilgrimage, and I'm on Robben Island. And I'm with a group of people who include Sammy Awad. And we, on our first full day, we do a pilgrimage around the island. We walk around, and we are, we're going to different sites, and we're really kind of considering the implications of what we're seeing. Robben Island, if you don't know, is the place where, where Nelson Mandela spent 18 years of his 20-something, 20 27-year-old, 27-year uh, imprisonment. The first place that we went to on Robben Island was the Lime Quarry. The lime quarry was the place of dehumanization. It was utter futility. They would cut rock on one day, and then they would pick it up, and they'd have to walk it all the way over, miles away, drop it. The next day, they'd come back, they'd pick up the same rock and bring it back to the quarry. And they did this again and again and again and again and again and again and again, and you get the picture. Feudal work. Fruitless work is the very definition of dehumanization in scripture. But you know what they did? They transformed the lime quarry into the university of the struggle. They literally taught young men who did not know how to read, how to read in the lime quarry. They taught the principles of the struggle to the young prisoners who were political prisoners, they taught those principles in the Lime Quarry. The Lime Quarry became the university of the struggle. The next place we went to was Mandela's cell, and everybody wants to go to Mandela's cell, for good reason. He slept on a mat about that big and about that wide for 18 years on concrete floor in a place that is devastatingly cold in the winter and devastatingly hot in the summer. And he was, and all of the prisoners in this block were cordoned off, quarantined from the rest of the prisoners. So there was isolation as well, which is also dehumanizing. And he lived in a single cell by himself, an isolation cell, again, dehumanizing. But outside of his walls, they actually had a little courtyard where they played tennis, believe it or not. They played tennis. But instead of just hitting the ball back and forth, they cut a hole, a slit in the ball, and they would communicate to the other prisoners with messages inside the tennis ball. <laughs> oh, sorry, went over the fence, sorry about that. They got it and they got the messages. And he also cultivated a garden. A garden. He transformed a place of dehumanization into a humanizing space. And it was in that garden that he actually hid the manuscript for a long, the long journey. You see, the spaces that were meant for oppression were actually transformed into places of resistance of dehumanization. And that was a word that stuck out to me that day. 
that the anti-apartheid movement was actually more than anything else. It was, an, it was a movement of resistance. But it wasn't just resistance to apartheid, like I'd always thought. It wasn't just resistance to a system, to a structure, to evil. It was resistance to dehumanization. It was resistance to the crushing of the image of God in the people. So everything from the protests to the lime quarry to the garden and even forgiveness once they came out. Everything was an act of resistance to dehumanization. And what do we know? We've heard, we've heard Genesis 1 quoted so much. I want to add just one piece to everything we've heard. That we were made in the image of God. To be human is to be made in the image of God. But in the same breath, that God says all humanity is made in God's image. In the same breath, the writers of Genesis said, and let them have dominion. What it means to be made in the image of God, what it means to be human, is to be called and to be created with the capacity to exercise dominion. Let me say it again. What it means to be made in the image of God, what it means to be human, is to be called by God and to be created with the capacity, all things equal, to exercise dominion. Now that word dominion has been sorely misunderstood by many over the years. It's been, it's been said to mean domination unto obliteration. It does not mean that. It has been said to mean we can do whatever we want because we are the height of creation. It does not mean that. I did a study of all of the words in Genesis that mean dominion or something like it. And there are about eight different ways that you can say the word dominion in Genesis. This way does not actually have mean specific governing. It does not actually mean rule. It does not actually mean to, to obliterate. It means literally to tread down. Now, imagine the context that they're writing in. It's an agrarian context. This is the first wilderness, the, the, the untamed wilderness. It is the, the, the wilderness that grows up and has a mind of its own unless you hem it in, unless you maintain the boundaries, unless you maintain the wellness of all of the relationships that God has created. And so it's actually more a picture of stewarding, maintaining the wellness of, maintaining the boundaries the, of, the, of the relationships that God has actually created between us, the wellness of those relationships. That is what dominion, rada, means in the text. And actually, if you look in Genesis 2, you see an even clearer picture of rada. You see, you know, the, the word's not used, but you see it when, when God puts the humans into the garden and says, till and keep it. Those words, till and keep, they actually mean serve and protect. Serve and protect the land. That is what it looks like to exercise dominion, God's kind of dominion. So the anti-apartheid movement was resisting the crushing of the image of God because these people who were crushed knew something in them knew. It was as if their souls were calling or connected to God somehow and just knew they were created for more than this. They were created to exercise dominion, but their ability to exercise agency, make choices that impact their world, be creative, actually make choices that rule and structure life, it had been limited. And so the image of God within them had actually been limited. And they cried out and they resisted it. Hallelujah. In the lime quarry, they resisted it. In the garden, they resisted it. And after they were released, they called the nation to resist dehumanization by offering forgiveness. Because only a human can forgive.
Now, earlier today, we heard about the logic of, of love. You see, the logic of love, for me, it goes back to Genesis, I'm sorry, Galatians 3, where it says, you know, no Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free. It is the place, it is that space where love calls us to rip down all of the structures, the policies, the, the things that our bias has built that actually create a society where some are on top and some are on the bottom. And in our world, in South Africa, here in the United States, and wherever you are, I bet you can find it, in our world, we have created those structures. I call them in America, and I'm not actually the only one. I actually, I have to say, I'm quoting a, a, a scholar named Andrea Smith, who talked to me recently about the logic of race, the different logics of race. But this is, this is the logic of race. The, race. the logic of race tells us some people were created to exercise dominion, and others were created to be dominated. Some people are called by God to exercise dominion and created with the capacity to exercise agency and make choices that impact our world. And others are simply not created with that call nor that capacity. That's the logic of race. straight from the devil. You see, the logic of love does not call us to be colorblind. The logic of love calls us to see the image of God in both Jew and Greek, to see the call and the capacity to, in both to exercise dominion. Now in South Africa, the interesting thing is the white South Africans' response to forgiveness took it as a message for them, for themselves. Ah, oh, we've been forgiven. Yay! You know, so now we can go down and have coffee without anything on our back. We're good. You know, we can go to the cafe, which they do all the time, and, you know, buy the seeds, sip the tea, no big deal. All right, we're good. But I was walking back from Mandela's cell, and I realized it hit me. That call to forgive was not for the sake of the white South Africaners and the white South Africans. It was for the sake of the black and the colored South Africans because it released them, it cut the tie that bound them to their oppressor. They no longer needed to shake what they needed out of their oppressor. They released their oppressor from needing them anymore. Now they had to get what they needed from God. That's what forgiveness did. But if forgiveness is not the message for the white South Afrikaners, then what is? Repentance. 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 And as I walked back from that cell, I was walking with a young man named Nkosi who, who lives in the black township today. And remember, this is 22 years after the end of apartheid. And I asked him, what would repentance look like in South Africa today? I mean, without missing a beat. His foot was coming up, and it, before it hit the ground, he said, restitution. Restitution, to restore the people to the land from which they were taken. Restitution. This is the rising conversation in South Africa. And the implications for us in the US, those of us here in the room in the US, and those here in Israel, Palestine. You see, South Africa, oh USers, South Africa got its ideas from us structures, policies, the very idea of separation. They got it from Jim Crow and from slavery and from the way that we treated Native Americans, the indigenous. South Africa is 22 years out from its colonizing experience. The US 
African Americans count is 50 years out from its colonizing experience because Jim Crow was an, a colonizing experience for us and it ended with the passage of the Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act. And the thing that struck me this week is that Palestine is still under its colonizing experience. We all still have structures of colonization in place. In the US and South Africa, it's de facto economic segregation. Here in Palestine, it is a structure called the law. And it is a web of laws, much like our Jim Crow laws, that, that prohibit movement, that order the course of life and limit the capacity of Palestinians to exercise dominion. It is a structure that crushes the image of God. And in all of these places, those who are empowered by the structures, those Christians tend to solve the problem and the cognitive dissonance of living there by building compassionate ministries and charity. But few fully repent of the systemic structures and systems that cause the disparity in the first place. In the U.S. and at home, wherever you are, we still have de facto segregated housing, de facto segregated schools, de facto segregated jobs, de facto segregated health care, de facto segregated justice system. And we still have people living on reservations with no running water. So what would repentance look like for us? What will it look like for you, wherever you are going home to? The text in Isaiah 58 tells us it looks like fasting from injustice. It looks like undoing the thongs of the yoke. It looks like breaking every yoke. It looks like speaking and doing justice. It looks like satisfying the needs of the afflicted. It looks like protecting, cultivating, serving the image of God in all the people in every corner of every space where we live. It looks like rejecting the logic of race. And it looks like accepting and embracing the logic of love. In America, it might look like the redistribution of health care to the poor. It might look like the redistribution of good education. It might look, the, like, look, look like the redistribution of pollution. Somebody say Flint. <laughs> it might look like the enactment, the reenactment of the Voting Rights Act to protect the right of the oppressed to be able to exercise dominion in the most fundamental way that a democracy offers, which is to vote. And it might look like the redistribution of immigrant rights, the protection of children who are being deported or who have their parents being deported. And I'm talking about America, but this is not only America. These issues exist everywhere. Everywhere colonization has touched. And now what would be the result? What would be the result if we were to repent, really repent? It would look like the text tells us our healing would spring forth. Our light would break forth. Our ancient ruins, somebody, would be rebuilt. Our foundations of many generations would be raised up. And then, and only then, could we legitimately be called repairers of the breach. I want us to sit for a moment and to ask the question as we wrap up, what will repentance look like for you? What are the ways that in your own home, in your own hometown, in your own home country, that either active resistance to the acknowledgement of the image of God and the call and capacity of those on the underside of the systems, active resistance to the reality that they were called and created to exercise dominion, or passive 
resistance to that truth. Just doing nothing. Being more concerned with how your Bible study went than with how the poor and the least were doing in your town. How, how do we have to repent? What is it that God wants to speak to us for? I'm going to give us some silent time for Jesus to talk to us. Because it is Jesus who was born in that manger, who was born in a trough with animals, who was born in the context of an oppressed people. He was born only a few years after a major pogrom of his people from the Romans, where thousands were crucified daily. He was born at a time when God entered space and time and declared, really declared, that he was now going to resist the kingdoms of men as he brought the kingdom of God. So where is it that God is calling us to resist? And in what ways? Let's just take a moment to reflect. And then when you're ready, what I'd like for you to do is to stand, and I'd like for you to join me in a song. And I'll begin to sing that song after a few moments when I feel like the Lord has said we're ready. If you, if you are ready to repent and to join in the movement of God that goes out from this space to resist injustice in all places where we go. God, show us what it is that you are calling us to resist. Show us the ways, Lord, that in our own hometowns, in our own home countries, there are those who, upon the logic of race, have been declared, created without the capacity to exercise dominion or the call. Show us who those people are where we live. Show us, Lord, how the ways things work around us reinforce that lie. And show us, God, how we can resist the lie. When you're ready to declare your intent to resist the lie, please stand. The lie of the logic of race. Sing with me. We 